Welcome back to Thursday Bible Study. My name is Cassie Waits, and I'm so glad that you're part of our conversation today. As we begin our time together, let's open with a word of prayer. Gracious God, we are so thankful for this day. We thank you for the chance to gather together, to study your word, to hear your voice. We lift up to you today our prayers for those who are sick, for those who are recovering, for those who are lonely and isolated, for all who are struggling, for all who are afraid, we pray. Lord, we also lift up to you our praises for new beginnings, new connections, and for the difficulties that inspire us to turn to you and depend on you. We thank you even for those because it is in difficult times that we learn to rely on you. Thank you, Lord, for providing all that we need. Help us to trust you always. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. As we close our study on parables, I, I want to go back to the beginning. I want to remember our definition of a parable and the process that we use to engage parables and to draw meaning from them. So let's start with our definition. What is a parable? A parable is a short story designed to provoke thought and teach a religious or moral principle or general truth. It includes real or literal occurrences to which the audience can relate. The second thing that we remember about parables is that the word parable is a, it comes from the Greek word parabola and it means to throw alongside. And a parable does this precisely. It throws some ordinary life event alongside a moral teaching or principle. That's why it's called a parable. And so again, we are reminded that the parable is not about the parable. The parable is not about the content of the parable. It's pointing us, that content is pointing us to something beyond the story itself, to some greater truth. We've also discovered a few techniques along the way, a few key questions that we can ask to get into these parables and to draw meaning from them. So what are those questions? Well, we could ask, what is the imagery in this parable? What's the backdrop to this parable, the setting? Second, we might ask, who are the characters in the parable? Who is the foolish character? in the parable because sometimes that foolish character helps us unlock the teaching of the parable. 
we might ask, what is the surprise twist in the parable? And finally, we wonder together, where is God in this parable? Where are we? And we know that God doesn't show up in every parable. Sometimes a parable is, is about how we are to treat one another. But sometimes it has to do with the kingdom of God. Sometimes the parable is teaching us about who God is and who we are. So these are some of the questions that we've been asking of our parables. And these are questions that you can continue to ask as you study parables. They aren't perfect questions. They're not magic questions. They're just ways of getting into the story and starting to pull meaning out of it. So we've remembered the definition of a parable. We've remembered some of the tools and techniques we've been using, some of the questions we've been asking throughout this study. But a wrap-up would not be a real wrap-up if we didn't also test how much we remembered from the past few months. So it's time for a little pop quiz. Question one. When a parable includes a landowner or a rich man, that figure is often associated with A. Jesus B. God the Father C. The Pharisees D. All the Jewish religious leaders Question 2 When a parable includes three stanzas, which stanza is the key to understanding the parable? A. The first B, the second, or C, the third. Question three. When a parable describes debt, what does that debt often symbolize? A, sin, B, sacrifice, C, money. Question four. When a parable includes a wicked figure, that figure is often associated with A. Jesus B. The Sadducees C. The Pharisees or D. Us for playing along with our game. I hope that you remembered a good bit from the spring and I hope you made some, maybe made some new connections as well. So one question that's been in my mind all spring has been this, why parables? Why would Jesus use parables? They are time consuming to engage with, they can be frustrating, and at the end, we might still not know exactly what we're supposed to learn from them. They seem to be a, a less effective way of getting the point across. They're at least not always very clear. Now, we're not the first people to be confused by parables. So if you've felt that as we've studied these stories, you're not alone. We know that the disciples felt that because they would ask Jesus what he meant after he gave a parable. And sometimes he would explain the parable to them, but sometimes we don't have an explanation from Jesus. But we do know that the disciples were also confused and we know we're confused. And so that, that raises the important question of why even use the parable. Let me throw this question back to you. Why do you think Jesus teaches with parables? One reason that I think Jesus uses parables is that parables are an ancient teaching tool in Jewish culture. 
Jesus doesn't invent parables. The New Testament isn't the first place we find parables. We find them in the Old Testament as well. One of the most famous parables is in 2 Samuel chapter 12. David has taken Bathsheba as his wife, had her husband killed, and apparently everyone knows about it. And the person who holds David accountable, who, who steps up to have a conversation with the king about what he's done and just how, how unfair and unjust it is, is the court prophet Nathan. And so we read that Nathan comes to King David and rather than point his finger at David and say, how dare you do this? Do you realize not only have you, you know, sinned against this woman and her husband, you've sinned against God and, and hold him accountable in that way. Nathan instead tells David a story, a parable. And in this parable, a very wealthy person takes advantage of a very poor person. And David is, is outraged. And as he pronounces judgment on the wealthy person, Nathan turns to him and says that, you know, you are the man. If suddenly, David can see himself more clearly because Nathan didn't attack him head on. Nathan gave him this story, this parable. One thing that makes parables effective is that they trick us. They, they trick us into this false sense of security. They, they come at us sideways instead of head on. So on one hand, we feel that they're ineffective because they're not clear. They, they, it's, like un, it's like untying a riddle. But on the other hand, parables are even more effective than direct language because they let us take ourselves out of the story just enough that we can see more clearly the dynamics of what is really going on and whether what we are doing is, is right or not. So this is one reason I think that I think Jesus uses parables. It's, it's part of his culture. It also can be a very effective tool at turning hearts, not at conveying clear and precise information, but at turning hearts. And if that's the goal, that's the goal of his teaching, then a parable is a, is a really good vehicle to do that. The second reason that I think Jesus uses a parable is a little more theological. And this might even be a little more challenging uh, for, for some folks. So I will say this is my understanding of, of what the using a parable means. But you may, you may come up with, with different ideas. Jesus doesn't just walk up and hand over a list of instructions for his disciples. That's not how he teaches. It's not how he administers his ministry. Instead, he invites them to contribute their own interpretations, their own um, unique perspectives to the ministry that he's building. A parable works in that way too. It sets up a structure but it doesn't give you the punchline to the story. You have to interpret that punchline. You have to engage with the parable to draw meaning out of it. The parable gets you part of the way there. It doesn't get you all of the way there. And I think this also indicates the approach that I see Jesus taking with his disciples, the approach I see God taking with us more generally, that we are not handed a list of instructions to follow. Instead, we are invited to be part of, of creating that map. What does it look like? Now, this is both wonderful and also terrifying because it means that we have real agency in our relationship with Christ. We are not just receiving instructions. We are helping write the story. And that's scary. But I actually think that that's what we're invited to do.
but there's something important about engaging and inviting interpretation. There's some kind of power being handed over to the listener in this. And there's an invitation, well, what do you make of it? And how do you take ownership of this story as well? So in this leads us to our final reflection question of the series. How is Jesus inviting you to take ownership, to co-create meaning in your faith journey? Thank you for being part of Thursday Bible Study. Until next time, may the Lord bless you, be gracious to you, and give you peace.